Right, I'm talking about humility this morning. Um, I want to talk about what it is. I want to ask the question what it is, what are the evidences of it in our lives, and uh, how do we cultivate it in our lives. So, what's humility? Being humble, um, I, look, I, had, I had a look in the diction, I thought, what's the exact definition from a Christian point of view, that is? Being lowly in spirit, meek, or modest. And that doesn't mean we're wimpy. <laughs> okay, so let's get that straight, first of all. It means we recognise our own weaknesses and that we need to trust God and not trust in ourselves, yeah? Being humble means knowing ourselves and accepting ourselves, yeah? Um, it means allowing God to enable you to overcome your weaknesses and not thinking you can do it on your own, okay? To be poor in spirit means yielding your personality to God and allowing him to make you all that he wants you to be. It means discovering the role that God wants you to fill and filling it for his glory, no matter how insignificant or unimportant it might seem. Yeah, it's important, isn't it? You know, the way we see ourselves and the way God sees us. So the believer who is lowly in spirit is in the... Uh, sorry, pa -pa -pa -pa. try again. In the place of God's choosing, fulfilling God's purpose and depending on the power that only God can supply. Yeah? Do we agree with that? Right, so what are the evidences of humility? Um, I've got four down, actually. Um, you, accept, you accept yourself, sorry, you accept others because you've accepted yourself. And that doesn't mean we always agree with other people, does it? Because we don't, do we? We know that. But it's easy to be intolerant of other people, isn't it? Yeah? And when others succeed, you don't become jealous of them. I don't know what's going on. Um, if we contrast David with Saul, we think about two different characters there. When David killed Goliath, King Saul was glad to get rid of his enemy, wasn't he? Yeah? And honour David. But when David started slaying his ten thousands, in contrast to Saul's thousands, Saul became jealous, didn't he? And he became angry. Um, David, David was humble, wasn't he? At no time did David use his position to promote himself, if you remember. But Saul was a proud man who deliberately disobeyed God. And I want to read an example of that from 1 Samuel 13. Some verses beginning at verse 5. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of beth -Avon. When the, the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, then the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead, as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. Then he waited for seven days, according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened, as soon as he had finished pre presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come with me, you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines to get gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, for which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own, his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So Samuel had commanded Saul to wait, basically, until he arrived to offer a sacrifice, because it wasn't King Saul's place to do that. He wasn't a priest. Uh, and he deliberately disobeyed what he was told. Um, 
we see Saul, uh, I suppose there was fear there, wasn't there? He was afraid and he acted, he acted in accordance with his fear and did what God said he shouldn't do instead of trusting God. Um, and verse 14 says his kingdom's going to be taken away from him and someone else is going to inherit it, which was David, wasn't it? Um, we see in the, the penultimate scene in Saul's life, we see him disguised as someone else and completely abandoned by God. He couldn't accept himself, could he? He couldn't accept who he was. And the next day he committed suicide on the battlefield. And that came to pass. You know, and as a result of his pride, he lost his crown, he lost his kingdom, and, and eventually he lost his life. He lost everything, didn't he? That's where pride leads us, or it can do. Right, number two, you accept your circumstances. When circumstances don't go your way, do you become angry and critical? Or are you willing to compromise to make things easier for other people? It's easy for me to say that. <laughs> we all do. We all do it, don't we? You know. We need to. We need to compromise, don't we? We don't need to be proud and not not give in. That's pride, isn't it? Yeah. When we won't compromise. Philippians four eleven. Isaac says what? To be what? Content. Content. Thank you. I couldn't hear you properly then, sorry. Yeah, I've learned whatever circumstances I'm in to be content. That's Paul speaking there. Um, again, are we in that place or not? It's a, it's a difficult thing to do, isn't it? We can't do it without God's help, can we? You know. But it doesn't mean we don't try and improve our circumstances. What he's saying is, when things are difficult, we don't spend the time complaining both to God and to other people. We don't whinge to those around us. Right, number three, having a right attitude towards things. And there's, there's a passage I want to read about that in a few minutes from Luke 12. Those who are poor in spirit don't find their satisfaction in things. It says a, a man's life in the Bible does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. Now, if things change my mind, my attitude rather, then things can become my master, can't they? Mm. Yeah? They become materialistic. The proud person is possessed by things, but the humble person uses the things he or she possesses for the good of others mm. and to glorify God, yes? That means our whatever time, money, whatever we've got, yes? Mm. Things. I want to read... I just want to read the parable of the rich farmer in 12, Luke 12, sorry, beginning at verse 13, which illustrates exactly what I'm talking about. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then those who, whose will those things be which you have provided? So he who is, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. That's an interesting story, isn't it? Um, he talks a lot about himself there. Um, there are 11 personal pronouns in that passage in the farmer's conversation with himself. He talks about himself to himself and he's got no concern for God has he or his hungry neighbour if he'd been poor in spirit he would have been rich towards God because he, he believed he was rich he lost everything didn't he he became poor and he lost everything so the lesson is let's be content with what we've got yeah it's nice to have material things isn't it but anything that comes before God is an idol and if we start becoming too materialistic then it's not, it's not good as it it's wrong 
some people, you know, to some people in the world, we're like millionaires, aren't we? Mm. I, I meant to look up the statistic on how many people live on less than a dollar a day, but it's, it's a lot. Mm. Yeah? We're rich, aren't we, compared to, to a lot of people in the world. Um, 1 Timothy 6. 7 and 8 says this. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Quite a sobering scripture, that is, isn't it? For us in the Western world, I guess. Okay. Accepting God's will, number four. The person who is poor in spirit accepts God's will for their life. The proud person resists God's will. And what does the Bible say about the consequences of being humble in James 4.10? It says, God will... Sorry, humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he will what? Yeah, he will lift you up or he will exalt you. The consequences of being proud are the opposite. Luke 14, 11 says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. So, think about that. Um, true poverty of spirit is the soil out of which the fruit of the Spirit can be cultivated. Yes? Do we agree with that? You know, when Saul was humble, God gave him a kingdom, but when he began to run things his own way, he lost it, didn't he? Mm -hmm. David gained his kingdom by being humble, and he kept it because he stayed humble. That was the difference between Saul and David, wasn't it? Saul became proud and lost everything, as we said. So how do we cultivate humility? Accept, I think I said this earlier, accept God's estimate, estimate of ourselves. And we have to do this to become Christians, don't we? Romans 3.23 says we've all sinned and we've fallen short of God's glory, doesn't it? And Romans 3.10 says not one of us is righteous, you know? Isaiah says all our righteous acts are as filthy rags, doesn't it? Yeah? So we have, to, we have to be humble, don't we? To get saved in the first place, Yeah? And once, once we accept God's estimate of who we are, it should be easy to uh, accept his remedy for our sins, which is salvation, isn't it? Yeah? Christ. So, we're not to think too highly of ourselves. Um, Romans 12.3 says, For I say to you, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to. So that's being humble, isn't it? Number two, yield ourselves to God on a daily basis. Um, if you remember the, um, the vine passage in John 15 at the beginning, in verse 5 Jesus says, Apart from me you can do nothing. Yeah, That's being humble, isn't it? When we acknowledge what he says. So we give him our mind, our body and our will. Yeah, and I talked about being living sacrifices a few weeks ago, didn't I? About giving him everything we've got. Um, including all those three things, our time, our money, our giftings, yeah? Um, the Word of God will transform our minds if we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Um, Romans 12, 2, we know it. Do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by what? Yeah, and you know I like using the... Uh, the library book analogy, don't you? And I'm going to say it again. If we renew a library book, we have to come back to the library, don't we? Yeah, with it. If we want to renew our mind, we come back to this, don't we? Yeah, that's the, that's the thing that transforms us when we read it and we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our life. Okay? Number three, focus on Christ and his blessings. There's nothing wrong with self-examination. But don't spend too much time looking in the mirror. <laughs> or you'll become vain like me. No, um, I don't mean literally. Um, if we become too self-critical and too introspective, we can be too hard on ourselves, can't we? And then, you know, we can have such a low opinion of ourselves that we think, well, I can't do this, I can't do that because I'm such a bad person, you know? Yeah? Don't dwell too much on things that, you know, shortfalls and shortcomings we have. We all have them, don't we? You know? 
and we have to acknowledge them. Um, Romans 2.4 says, sorry, the goodness of God leads to repentance. So the more you contemplate the goodness of God, the more, you cha- you, the more your attitude towards him sort of change, yeah? Who he is mm-hmm. and what he's done for us as, we, as we've, we've celebrated this morning, haven't we? We remembered what he's done for us on the cross, what he gave, which was everything. Um, David says in 1 Chronicles 17, 16, Who am I, O God, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? Again, David there acknowledging his humility and focusing on who God is. Right, number four, look for opportunities to serve others. Galatians 5.13 says, Do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. If we blow our own trumpet every time we do something, we help someone, what are we doing? We're feeding our pride, aren't we? Um, There's a well-known passage in Luke's Gospel I want to read, which you'll be familiar with, from Luke 18 starting at verse 9. This is Jesus speaking. Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So there we have it again, don't we? Yeah? The Pharisee is proud, isn't he? And he makes it known to everybody, his heart. uh, And and the tax collector isn't. He's humble before God, isn't he? He won't even raise his head to look up to heaven. Quite a humble person there. So we've got a contrast again between the two and the consequences of what happens when we're proud and when we're humble. Jesus said, if you recall, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, didn't he? Yeah, leaven is a metaphor for pride. Because what does, what does leaven do to bread? Puffs it up, lifts it up, doesn't it? Pride puffs up, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a serious sin. I was thinking about um, Isaiah 14, I think it is earlier. The fall of Satan. What led to the fall of Satan? Pride. Yeah, it's a very serious sin. So... In looking for opportunities to serve others, don't look for big opportunities. Start small. Yeah, they'll come in time. You've heard me say I started preaching at the old folks' home with Chris a long 20-odd years ago. You know, and I, I wasn't ready to preach in church then, but, you know, it happened. And eventually, God, when you're ready, God will give you a bigger task to do or whatever, if you like. If you think of it that way, perhaps not. Perhaps, perhaps not so, but... Whatever we do for God is important, isn't it? But God will exalt us if, we, if we're humble, and he'll give us greater opportunities to serve him. You know, you think about the great, some of the great saints of the Bible, like Moses. Moses tended <coughs> sheep, didn't he? Yeah? And also David was a shepherd. And look, look where they ended up. Yeah? Because they were humble. That's why. Pride is the sin that invites Satan to rule in your life. You know? And we said... It's the sin that costs uh, Saul his crown and ultimately his kingdom and his life. But humility made David a king, didn't he? And because he stayed humble, he kept his kingdom, didn't he? You know? He was a man after God's own heart. Okay, then in summary, what's, what's, pri- uh, sorry, what's humility? It means we recognise our weaknesses and we trust in God and not in ourselves, as we said. Being humble means knowing ourselves and accepting ourselves. Characteristics of a person who is humble. We, we accept others because we accept ourselves. We accept our circumstances. We have a right attitude towards things, that's possessions, and we accept God's will for our lives. And if we are humble, God will exalt us, as we've already said a number of times. We cultivate, try again, 
We cultivate humility by accepting God's estimate of ourselves, yielding ourselves to God on a daily basis, focusing on Christ and his blessings, and looking for opportunities to serve others, and starting, starting small, and then God will, God will exalt us, as I said, and lead us into greater opportunities to serve him. So I want to just finish by asking the question, are you humble? <laughs>